Good morning, everybody, and welcome to VG Myths, the online internet video game TV show that has no idea how to play video games but feels the need to push them to the limit anyway. Cave Story is the indie game that defines all indie games, tasking you with exploring the caves of a floating island and blowing everything you see away with an ever increasing arsenal of deadly power. But to be fair, we're guests in this neighborhood, so tonight we're taking politeness to the next level and making it our mission to reach the game's ending with the absolute minimum amount of murder. Can you beat the Cave Story Pacifist Challenge? To complete the challenge, we must reach the game's ending while only killing enemies that are directly required for progression. Since the game doesn't directly acknowledge murder, defining exactly what does and doesn't count as a kill requires a little bit of semantics, so I decided to go with the closest thing to a rules list the game provides. A kill is defined as defeating anything listed during the end credits cast list through a direct attack from the player. Anything not listed in the cast list is fair game, and, as mentioned, if it's required for story progression, it's totally not our fault and we can continue the game guilt-free. With the rules set, it's time to start our non-violent quest. Though we can blaze through the tutorial area, it does also feature our first required kill, The Door, a soft tutorial preventing players from progressing unless they demonstrate they know how to fire a gun. Even if you try to walk through without murdering it, you'll just get a text box instead. The first couple areas after that can be walked through fairly easily, just remember not to fight Balrog. He's polite enough to literally give you a yes or no option. You'll notice during the required fight with Igor that since you can't kill enemies, weapon XP is slim pickings and your damage dealing potential is going to be extremely low as a result, but the early boss patterns are so simple this shouldn't be an issue. Once you reach Grasslands, you'll be able to grab our early game boss damage dealer, Fireball. Plus, you'll start to get a much better idea of how this run is going to go down. I hope this goes without saying, but you should be grabbing absolutely every health and missile upgrade along the way. Whenever you get hit, try to run past as many enemies as possible, hopefully making it to a safe area where you can save and heal before you run out of health. In Grasslands, we'll have to kill exactly three Kurara for jellyfish juice. Kurara is absolutely surrounded by enemies. Not only are they trying to kill you, they're cannon fodder that die at the drop of a single fireball. Instead of fighting here, use the tried and true technique of running away like a little sissy baby after dealing a single point of damage. After any damage, Kurara will follow you to the ends of the earth, so you can trap it at the left boundary for a safe and easy kill. Small note, you won't be able to grab the heart capsule in the execution chamber. Our jump height isn't quite high enough yet, but with all the other health upgrades, you should be okay. After a few easy fetch quests, we face Ballfrog, the game's first real challenge. Every time Ballfrog moves, he'll summon a single frog in a random location. Frogs are legally people and stay on screen until the battle is over, so we need to take down Ballfrog ASAP or else the battlefield will quickly become an impassable wall of croaking doom. We don't have any time to waste dodging, so instead, just take the hit, walk straight through Ballfrog, and shove fireballs into his mouth as fast as possible. If his first couple frogs don't land close enough to get themselves killed, you should get him down to almost dead when he does a super jump and rains down an army of frogs. Get him to attack again and make a couple extremely careful shots from midair. Once his health bar reaches zero, every frog in the room will spontaneously combust in an incredible fiery explosion, which is totally not my fault. In Sand Zone, we go straight into the next boss fight with Curly Brown. Race. She's protected by four Mamiga, and though it's not technically possible to kill them since they stand right back up, I decided to err on the side of caution and beat Curly without hitting them once. Try luring them to the opposite edge of the room, leaving Curly totally open to attack. They also only deal two damage to you, so you don't have to pay much attention to dodging. After non-lethally murdering Curly, you'll have to make an important moral decision. Just how awesome do you want your primary murder weapon to be? The machine gun is a tempting first option of several weapon trading opportunities, but I recommend having having patience and holding out for later. Also, while in the back room, take a detour through this secret passageway for an item. This is very important. The boss fight with Omega is no different from a casual playthrough, but just for fun, I decided to see if I could beat it without destroying any of its projectiles. Have patience and look for an opportunity when the cogs aren't bouncing too close, spam out a volley of fireballs, and be careful not to fire out a single extra shot that could bounce past. I absolutely do not recommend doing this though, since these cogs drop weapon XP, potentially letting you level up all your weapons to level three in preparation for later. Head down to Lower Sand Zone for the dog fetching quest, pick up a life pot from Jenka and start the 
rabid Toroko boss fight. This one is pain. Every time Toroko throws a block, it turns into a flower that constantly follows you. And yes, flowers are legally people, so we need to finish the battle with all of them intact. Rather than actively trying to dodge the flowers, get them to crowd around you in the indent in the center of the room. They only deal one damage, and this indent is a great choke point to prevent Toroko from spawning any on the left side of the screen. Lead all the flowers to safety, wait for Toroko to jump left, then spam out as many shots as you think you can get away with before returning to the safety of the horde. Even if Toroko manages to dodge a fireball, there won't be any flowers behind her that could potentially be hit. This strategy is a little bit RNG dependent since Toroko could potentially stay on the right side for an uncomfortably long amount of time, but all it takes is one success, making all the flowers wither away of their own volition. As a reward, you'll receive King's Blade, which will be a huge damage dealer for the rest of the game. There is a tiny asterisk before we move on, though. We're immediately thrown into the labyrinth, which does have an immediate save point, but no opportunity to heal until a few rooms later. You'll need to beat Toriko with a good amount of HP left over as a buffer. I had 11 HP going into the labyrinth, which was just barely enough to reach the rest point. Unfortunately, immediately after that rest point, you'll have to face one of the hardest pacifist battles in the game, Monster X. Gaudi are littered across the arena, dealing tons of contact damage, spamming out a ludicrous barrage of projectiles, and preventing you from safely attacking since there's such a huge risk of blowing them away as collateral damage. I absolutely do not recommend fighting fair. Just before the arena is a safe spot where you can farm for health and weapon XP from the Gaudi's projectiles. Plus, if you're lucky, a few of the grounded Gaudi will jump past the left edge, which they can never jump back from. During the battle, you can keep yourself going a bit longer by intentionally bumping into the laser walls at the edge, which only deal a single point of damage. Plus, using Jenka's life pot here is totally worth it and will give you the edge you need to outlast Monster X without having to sink in an ungodly number of hours. Be very careful not to die on your trip to the right, since the enemies don't spontaneously combust like usual, and immediately bank a save in the next room. If you're low on health, don't worry, you can go back to this room to farm projectiles, effectively giving 100% refill. Also, be the absolute biggest jerk possible and ignore Booster as he sits dying in the pit. It's a little weird and iffy, but if you talk to him, you will directly kill him, invalidating the run. Quote is just that bad at Bedside Manor. Get ready to have some fun, cause I've got good news. Curly is not a pacifist. Jammed the best music in the game as she destroys everything she sees with reckless abandon, taking the opportunity to peacefully loot the corpses for any health you need along the way. You might think the core is a required kill since it needs to die to finish the game, but thanks to Curly's bloodlust, we can keep our hands clean. Get the core to low health, sit back, and pretend to be shocked as Curly commits a murder. What appalling behavior. I was only coincidentally around a witness. You can get through the waterways with normal damage boosting strat, and once you make it back to Mamiga Village, Booster will reward you for not accidentally murdering him with the Booster 2.0. With this baby, there are no more problem areas for a good while. You can just blaze past every enemy, grabbing the remaining upgrades, including the one in the execution chamber from earlier. Go back to the tutorial area to finally trade in your Polar Star for one of the best weapons in the game, the Spur. This baby trades in the weapon XP mechanic for a charge mechanic, and it's gonna be our main damage dealer from now on. Along the way to the plantation, Kazoo Zuma offers you the bad ending in which you give up and let the doctor start the apocalypse. Technically, this would be the earliest ending for us to get and therefore be the most pacifist option, but that ending doesn't actually count and I've got a really important semantic reason. That would be dumb. You should have 50 health, 30 missiles, and a replacement life pot before going into the last cave. This place is packed with enemies, spikes, and lava, but with all your health, you can invulnerability frame straight through. The final piece of the challenge is a series of four boss fights, but thankfully, we can easily control the way they spawn enemies. Misery will occasionally make bats appear, but only up to four at a time, and they disappear when they collide with a wall. The doctor, meanwhile, is capable of spawning bats, but you'll never even see them if you kill them fast enough. The final boss, the Undead Core, is protected by a possessed Misery and Sue. If you deal damage to Misery, she'll summon a truckload of enemies, so be careful not to land a single shot on her. Patiently wait for the core to open its face, mash in a bunch of blades, and once its health bar reaches zero, you're home free. With the island crumbling behind us as we make our jump to safety, the Cave Story Pacifist Run is mission complete! Special thanks to all Patreon backers, including Butte, Mesa, Delete, 
Heavy Press, Green Devil, Balos, oh god, oh no, and welcome to Pacifist Hell. No more charades, this was never an any percent run, you know why you're here. The true conclusion to any cave story challenge run can only be found within the Bloodstained Sanctuary, the ultimate final level that tests your skills to survive in a tidal wave of death and destruction. And worst of all, we've been given a permanent weapon upgrade. During this section, we simultaneously play as Curly, firing a backward shot with one of the best weapons in the game with every press of the fire button, killing most enemies in one hit. And it isn't as simple as running past everything, along the way are deletes that must be killed to open the path forward. The odds are stacked against us, and even with the best laid plan, you're gonna need to do a ton of thinking on your feet and a metric semi-truck of luck. During the opening fall, bank all available weapon XP in the missile launcher. You're gonna need its super fast killing power. Immediately after entering room number two, begin charging the spur. Remember, Curly only takes a shot when you press the button, not when you release it. The falling debris deals 10 damage and buttes deal only five. Of course, try to dodge them all as much as possible, but if push comes to shove, make sure it's always a butte that touches you and ride your invulnerability frames all the way. If you want a successful run, you'll wanna hit room number three with at least 25 HP. Grab some hearts, head directly into the first elite, release the spur in its face, and start a new charge while firing toward the ceiling. Then do some fast-paced dodging backwards as you wait for it to explode. Break the upper middle row of blocks with a charge shot, triggering the delete and potentially leaving a narrow enough path not to be followed. Depending on your luck, you might end up being safe in the next hallway as well. Rush to the lower heart, then intentionally take touch damage from an archer as you climb up to the top path. Archer touch damage is the lowest damage source in the area, letting you keep invulnerability frames with the lowest sacrifice. Note that you have to to kill either this delete or the lower mesa since both block the path forward. Don't start charging your next spur shot just yet. A non-max level 3 shot is capable of traveling through deletes at point blank, and a well-aimed one will kill the next two deletes simultaneously. When firing the shot, keep an ear out to make sure you don't hear an off-screen butte's death noise. About now, you'll probably be one hit away from death, so use your life pot to refill to full. Once again, leave your spur on charge until you reach the spike pit with the two final deletes, letting you time another double kill. Jump up to the archers to take the minimum amount of damage and rush into the heavy press boss fight. At the absolute first moment the battle begins, spam missiles into its weak point, stopping right when the first buttes are about to fly above you. Done right, you can kill it before it fires a shot with zero collateral damage. We've got one short moment to breathe before the final boss battle and a final opportunity to heal. Head into the statue room, carve them to pieces, and pray to Pixel they draw parts. It's finally time to face the true final boss, Balos. You'll want to go into the battle with at least 23 HP, otherwise the strategy I use is useless. Phase 1 doesn't have any other enemies, but make sure your killing blow is horizontal because enemies spawn above you in Phase 2. Balos' eyes are his weak point and are dangerously close to these enemies, but there's a trick to make it impossible to hit them. Equip Blade, stand in Balos' eye, and get a few hits in while facing outward. Blade will instantly collide with the eye and despawn, preventing your attacks from getting away as well as dealing massive damage. The first half of Phase 3 can be done with normal casual strats since every spiked eye can be killed from the ground, but once they're all down, Balos will rise in the air for your last showdown. The Green Devils go away and will soon be replaced with an army of buttes, but if you act fast enough, you can kill Balos before they spawn. Take touch damage from the lower spikes as they near the room center, fly into Balos' left eye, face outward, and start spamming like you've never spammed before. You'll take 10 damage from the spike ball twice, but before you can take a third hit, Balos' health bar will reach zero. With the island saved and only like three dozen murders under your belt, the Cave Story Pacifist Run is mission complete. Also, one final message. This only applies to about 0% of this video's audience. If any staff at Nicholas are watching, could you, like, pretty please patch Cave Story Plus on Steam to fix the Curse Broken achievement, maybe? But I feel is important to note, players already know how to fix, and has just been sitting unfixed for seven years. Pretty please, thank you. No, no hard feelings. I'm looking forward to playing Crystal Crisis, by the way. Uh, Thank you for getting blackjack. Special thanks to all Patreon backers, including Andrew Cyber, Mrs. Seckman, Holy Mother of Cheese on a Holy Cracker, Leslam, RB Drock, Zon Zero, Mr. Harry Wonka, Alexander Botkin, Chris Nate, Anyu, Ikrira, Jez, Robert B. Brachier, Citrus Lush, Zayna Bain, BCR Main Sound, Joshua Bradbury, Vincent Hall, Basinger 313, Vincent YT, Yellow Alert, Game Guy Rusty, and on 42, Suit, Alex Nelson, Pepsi Man EXE, I'm Justin, The Quacky Gamer, Chocolate Boy 97, Bainbridge, Kazoy, Maxwell Hairmans, Melmos, Luminescent Dragon, Jason Ilges, Maxoid, Liddy Kitty, Nissan Abraham, Z Master, 
Blaster, Leo 60228, Shoebox, Stick, Binky Doot, Soren Petrikin, and Xavi G. Let me know how much this video sucks and how I can improve in the comments below. Special huzzas for watching and get out of my house.